Well done, Baku, but unfortunately, that's not funny anymore, especially if you're Ferrari. Leclerc had a flawless weekend up until the race start, where he locked up, went a little bit wide, and let Checo take the race lead. But dropping back to P2 was not the worst thing that happened for Leclerc. During the race, four Ferrari-powered cars DNF'd, including Leclerc and Sainz. This gave the Red Bulls a reasonable lead in both the Drivers' and Constructors' Championship. But this could also have severe implications on Ferrari taking penalties for engines later in the season. Speaking of the Red Bulls, this is probably the first time in ages we've seen Checo, the tire whisperer, actually struggling with his tires. A lot of people were talking about team orders again, but we're going to look into that in just a minute. Porpoising was another huge topic in Baku. For some drivers, it didn't seem too bad. For other drivers like Lewis, he struggled to get out of the car with back pain after the race. There's seriously something going on, and we'll touch on that in a little bit as well. Lastly, there was a little discussion about strategy choices for McLaren and some discussion also about team orders again. So we're going to dig into that, but I feel like the uh, Drive to Survive crew is trying to bring all the drama from the internet. But we're going to break that down and try to understand exactly what happened. We've got a few questions, so let's dig into the numbers. So just looking at the race results, the Red Bulls take an easy one, two after the Ferraris drop out. Russell and Hamilton bring the Mercedes home in third and fourth place. The Alfa Tauri looked pretty strong in the race with Pierre Gasly coming home at P5, just ahead of Sebastian Vettel in sixth. Unfortunately for Sebastian, he finished sixth, which breaks his streak here in Baku. Before this weekend, he had finished no lower than fourth position. Tsunoda was likely to finish P7, but he had a long pit stop to repair his broken rear wing flap. Alonso comes home in seventh ahead of the McLarens of Ricardo and Norris. And Alcon rounds out the top 10. So what does this mean for the Drivers' Championship? You can see here the points accumulated through the whole season for each of the drivers. We've got another disaster weekend for Leclerc. Obviously, DNF in Spain, no points. Poor strategy in Monaco. And then a DNF in Baku brings Leclerc all the way down to P3 in the driver's standings. At race three, his gap was insane. Unfortunately, the tables have turned and the Ferrari now on the back foot. Russell, with Mr. Consistent not finishing any lower than fifth in a race this entire season, is now fourth in the driver's championship. Carlos, again this weekend, unlucky. He is down to fourth. Sainz is back to fifth overall in the driver's championship. Hamilton back in sixth with a decent gap to the rest of the field, 37 points behind Russell. Norris is in seventh with 50 points gap to Ricardo, who's all the way down in 13th with only 15 points. Ocon and Gasly taking up ninth and 10th respectively in the driver's championship right now. All right, now it's time. Let's have a look at the race trace and just talk about what happened. I've used Russell here as the reference. You can see him along this line. So it makes it a little bit clear to see what's happening for everybody else. In terms of pace, the Red Bulls and Ferraris just kind of doing their own thing. They were going to run away with this Grand Prix, completely leaving the Mercedes behind. Russell a little bit in no man's land ahead of everybody else at the end of the race. Somehow, Latifi gets a penalty before the race even starts, and you can see him serving that penalty there. So here we have the signs DNF, which triggered a early pit stop from Leclerc from P2. That gave him an early opportunity to switch tires onto the hard and try to convert this maybe to a long one stop. Unfortunately, we can see Leclerc retiring here. So the first thing to look at is the Red Bulls and Max overtaking Perez. Some of the people on Twitter and everything else were talking about team orders, but it looks like Checo starts to struggle with his tires here and Max with an easy overtake. We're going to look at this a little bit more in a minute, so we'll get back to it. Throughout the rest of the race, Max has a a pretty clear gap on Checo, both of the guys managing tires to the end to bring home the Red Bulls in P1 and P2. During the beginning of the race, there were some interesting comms between Ricardo and Norris. Ricardo basically saying, I have a bit of pace, let me pass so I can have a go to Alonso. We're also going to dig into that. What did McLaren do right and what did they do wrong? And is there anything they can learn from that? You can see here at the end of the race, Hamilton overtakes Gasly to bring home the Mercedes in P4 behind Russell in P3. Tsunoda was on for a good finish until he had a lengthy pit stop to repair his broken rear wing flap here. Uh, unfortunately, no points for Yuki today. And I have no idea why I rescaled this graph to show Latifi. Um, yeah, that's on me. Sorry. Now, is there something in Ferrari's race pace compared to their qualifying pace? Let's try to have a look at the data in the race and compare it to qualifying to see if we can find anything out. Realistically, race data is difficult to analyze because you have different fuel loads, you have traffic, and you have tire saving. Whereas qualifying, the guys are just going flat out but we'll try and pick the bones out of that. We're also going to have a look at Mercedes and see how they looked on their race pace versus their qualifying pace. Now, let's go back to our qualifying pace chart. So this is the fastest driver for each team, and I have shown the percentage gap to pole position. You can see here the Ferrari is the baseline, the Red Bull at around 0.3% off, and then a massive gap 
and Baku to the Mercedes. The Mercedes, the third fastest team at a whopping 1.3% off of pole. I mean, that's, that's huge. Looking at this data, I would expect everybody from the Mercedes all the way back to the McLaren to be probably in a similar race. Whereas uh, the Alfa Romeo kind of off on their own and then the Haas and the Williams, I'm expecting these guys to be completely off the back of the field based on their qualifying pace alone. But from this, you could see the Red Bull and the Ferrari should run off into the distance. Now let's have a look at the exact same thing, but look at our stint average paces for a few different teams during the race. Now, now keep in mind again, there's fuel saving, there's tire saving, there's pace management, and there's traffic. So this isn't like the perfect example, but it's as close as we can get to try and understand where people sit in terms of qualifying pace and race pace. So in this chart, I've lined everything up and I've ranked the stint average fuel corrected paces. You can see the driver name, the stint number, and which compound they were on. All of the stint paces are calculated in terms of percentage to the fastest stint of the race, which was Leclerc's medium. Now, keep in mind, these are stint averages, but degradation wasn't too crazy. So the only big caveat we have in here is tire management, but we'll just have to make do with what we've got. I've also thrown the Alpha Tari in here so we can see what their race pace looked like. Clearly, the Mercedes on pace during the race, much faster than Alpha Tari. So Leclerc's medium stint, his first stint was our baseline, and this kind of stacks up with everything else we've seen. You know, Verstappen at 0.1% off of that on his second stint on the hard and then for the rest of these on the red bulls i think you're seeing a lot of pace management in their second and third stints unfortunately with the dnfs for the ferrari we don't have that much of their pace data signs seems to have absolutely no pace on his medium I mean, looking here, Sainz can barely hold on to the rest of the field. I don't expect that to be very surprising. His qualifying pace was a little bit off. Probably he just wasn't as comfortable in the car as Charles this weekend. So the qualifying and race pace for Sainz kind of stacks up a little bit off. Perez's stint three on the hard. It looks like he's just cruising. Honestly, we know for a fact that they were managing tires to the end, and there's probably a good reason. And I'll explain that in just a minute. Now, compared to the Mercedes qualifying pace, their race pace actually looks reasonable. Considering they were about 1.3% off on their flat out qualifying laps. We see them only on their fastest stints about 1 to 1.4% off. So it looks like the qualifying pace is probably a good indication of their actual gap to the front. Realistically, I think the Ferraris are a faster car in both qualifying and the race, but their only problem now is reliability. Now for the tinfoil hats, let's go and talk about the Red Bull team orders. I really don't think these were team orders and let's have a quick look at the data to try and understand exactly what happened. Around lap 13 or 14, you heard Checo's race engine you tell him no fighting. A lot of people got a little bit excited about this on Twitter, but all he meant was keep it clean. They definitely did not want a 2018 Baku repeat. So during their first stint, you see Max overtake Checo what looks like pretty easily, but Checo was actually struggling with his rear tires. You can see after the overtake, he's pushing pretty hard and he degs off quite severely before stopping. So let's look at that and try to understand what happened. Now, I don't think Perez made it too difficult and that was probably a smart decision for them to maximize their advantage during the race. Perez was mentioning on the radio that his tires were overheating quite early. Why is that? Checo is usually the tire whisperer, right? Now, if I had to guess, I'm looking at the race pace at the beginning of the race, Checo's lap times here were mental, whereas you can see Leclerc and Verstappen and Sainz kind of easing into it. I think Perez got the race lead and hit the tires pretty hard, and they fell away much sooner than he expected. You can see here, consistent lap times, and then the tires just falling away before boxing. So just looking at it, did Checo's first two or three laps on that new tire actually hurt him in the race? I think he was still confused about this afterwards when talking to the press. Now for the rest of the race, Max seems quite a bit faster than Checo. Now was this Checo just consolidating his race or was that him a little bit spooked by how much degradation he had early on in the first stint? Both of the drivers managing the tires to the end of the race. So I think the team were surprised by how much deg Checo got. And then after Ferrari DNF'd, it was an easy one too for the team. Now during the broadcast, we heard a lot of discussion between Norris and Ricardo and their engine engineers. It made the whole thing seem a little bit dramatic, but let's have a look at the data and see what we can understand from that. The interesting thing, Ricardo started on a hard tire behind Norris on a medium. It is not uncommon to see teams split strategies, especially when starting further back. You never know what's going to happen with safety cars, VSCs. Depending on how the race unfolds, either of those strategies could have worked out just fine. So let's take a step back, look at the data and see what we can understand from this. Now for this, I've highlighted a section of the race. We've got Hamilton all the way back to Ocon. You can see at the start of the race, Ricardo on the hard, making a small small gap to Lando on the medium and both of them following closely behind Alonso. So this is where it starts to get a little bit interesting. You can see Norris starting to dag off a little bit, losing pace relative to everybody else. We see Alonso pit here, but Norris waits for two laps to cover. And at this point, he's also pushing Ricardo back. 
Now, Ricardo also gets overtaken by two cars, which pushes him back even further, but he's also going long on this hard tire. Unfortunately, he pits and comes out just behind Alonso. Now, should they have let Ricardo free after this lap? Maybe he would have been closer to Alonso, but I don't think it made much difference to their race. I don't think we were going to see a McLaren overtake an Alpine, and I'm about to show you exactly why. Now, at the end of the race, Norris starts to close up to Ricardo. Realistically, I think this was the race finish for the McLaren, but let's have a look at the Alpine and why neither McLaren was going to get past them. Now, here is Alonso and Norris on lap 50, right? Now, Alonso's behind Vettel, and he's got a little bit of a toe, but he's not in DRS range. He's followed by Ricardo and Norris. Norris has the DRS as he is close to Daniel, but let's look at the data. So we've got Alonso in green with no DRS, and we've got Norris in pink with his DRS on. Yes, Norris is a little bit faster here down to turn four with DRS, but look at the main straight. Alonso is gapping him down the entire straight. I really don't think either of the McLarens had the speed in hand to even attempt an overtake on an Alpine. McLaren, not much of a straight line speed car this season, so I don't think Montreal is going to be very kind to them either. Now, there's a lot to talk about porpoising and its impact on the driver's health and well-being, but to be completely honest with you, I am so bored of hearing about porpoising, so I'm going to make this short. Here's what I think about the whole thing. If a team's car has severe implications on a driver's health and well-being, it is the responsibility of the team to resolve that. If resolving this costs a team performance, that is on the team. It's up to the teams to ensure that their drivers are safe, and it's not up to the FIA to police this and make everybody else slow because one team has missed the mark in the design of their car. Anyway, I am completely sick of talking about porpoising, so that's my take on it. Montreal is next, another low downforce, long straight, bumpy circuit. I will not be surprised to see the Ferrari and the Red Bulls out front with a pretty severe gap to the midfield. In terms of the midfield pecking order, I don't see that much changing from Baku. Unfortunately, we're going to be talking about the porpoising thing again, I'm sure. And after Ferrari's engine issues, Leclerc was on his third turbo. If he has to take another turbo, that'll be a 10 place grid penalty. Let's see what happens in Montreal. See you next time.